Um, now we're going to move on to our next session, which is a panel. So we are going to accept questions from you. Um, and I am here with Danny, who you've met before. And this is Alvin. Uh, both are assistant professors at McEwen. And they uh, have started working in the journalism program. And um, I'll actually get them to do a introduction to themselves. So uh, Alvin, I'll start with you. OK, so my name is Alvin Ntibinyani. So but my official names are Ntibinyani and Ntibinyani. So basically, my first name and my last name are the same. So Alvin is my middle name, and I go by Alvin. So I've been a news reporter for 21 years now. The first time I uh, you know, walked into a newsroom was 2003, around September. So yeah, I've been, you know, I've, and I've started first as a cub reporter. A cub reporter normally is just a young reporter, hungry and all that, move uh, up the ladder, reporter, senior reporter, uh, you know, investigative uh, reporter, bureau chief, uh, editor, editor-in-chief and all that before I started my own investigative you know, journalism net, uh, network or, or center, should I say that, yeah. Uh, yeah, so basically this is who I am, and uh, I've been a teacher, I've been a professor for some time, four years now, started first in Saskatchewan, where I taught journalism courses, and then went to Ontario, uh, where I also did the same thing, taught you know, at a college, uh, mostly foundational courses, introduction to, to, to journalism, interview and research and all that. But also, yeah, I've, I've traveled a lot. I was just, uh, uh, this morning, I was just talking to my wife about you know, the number of countries that I've been. I've been to about 42 countries now. So I've been like all over the place, uh, mostly in Africa, also in Europe, uh, also now here in Canada, where I'm now uh, uh, you know, a resident and a citizen. Yeah, and uh, Alvin's also a Pulitzer Prize winner. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> so we are very excited to uh, have that uh, oh, contribution. Um, Danny. Yeah, Danny or Danielle Parody. Um, I've been a journalist, I think, for about, let's say, 12 years. And uh, I've done a mix of magazine writing, uh, McLean's, Chatelaine, um, the Walrus, the mostly Canadian publications, a bit of a stint online during the blog years of 2013 where I was writing for American audiences. Um, now, and then I have mostly done my career through freelancing, podcasting, working at Canada Land, and then more recently at APTN, as I mentioned this morning, the Aboriginal People's Television Network. So we met, we saw the national broadcaster today. APTN is the Indigenous National Broadcaster, but it's located out of Winnipeg. I was in a home bureau, however. Um, podcasting as well, I've done both at Canada Land and at APTN, where I focused on like audio storytelling. So print, audio, magazine writing, that's most of my thing. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Uh, do you mind telling us a little bit more about uh, what type of news that you cover? So yeah, we'll, sure. yeah, we'll continue with <laughs> okay. you, Danny, and then we'll go to Alvin. Um, so like I mentioned with the audio storytelling, that was a part of what I've done. Uh, magazine writing, it's usually, it's not a newsy topic in the same way that we, when we were seeing local news, we were seeing people talking about something happening that day, you know, people going to Terwilliger, there's a festival happening. Magazine writing is usually uh, slower and kind of a further um, bird's eye view looking at a story. Uh, so when we heard about the first draft of history, I don't think that magazines are quite as grandiose as like the second draft of history, but it's a more fulsome exploration of what's happening when it comes to breaking news. Uh, what happens, you know, in a community when a flood happens and everybody leaves? What happens when, in like, a constant wildfire trauma? Those sorts of stories. I interviewed um, women who were for who were firefighters. Uh, then at uh, APTN with Daily News, it was it was a mixture because it's such a small newsroom. So I've done cultural. Um, as well as daily news and then hard news, investigative news, so kind of all of it, because it's uh, there's only two uh, reporters that work for APTN in Alberta. So as you can imagine, um, the newsrooms that we saw were small, but they weren't quite as small as the Indigenous broadcaster, where you're you just can't possibly cover all the stories that you need to in that area and that space. Yeah. Thank you, um, Alvin. Yeah, so basically when I started, when I started, like I said, I started 21 years ago. When I started as 
started first covering general news. This is what you do when you start. You know, you are just chased around. You are you know, going to court, covering the police, this and that, uh, entertainment, sports, and all that. You know, you're just a general you know, assignment reporter. But with time, you know, I started moving up. I became a political reporter, where I sort of now started you know, chasing the politicians around and all that. But with time now, you know, I think uh, maybe five or six years into my career, I became an investigative reporter. So that's what I've done. Uh, since then, I figured I've been a, an investigative reporter for 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 15 years now. So basically, my interest was really trying to sort of, you know, uh, investigate the politicians, investigate, you know, uh, you know, business interests to say, uh, you know, how are you using our money? How are you using our our taxpayers and all that, and hold them accountable, uh, whether they're betraying the public trust or not, and all that. So basically, that involves really digging into. Uh, data involves really, uh, you know, uh, you know, analyzing data and really presenting it to the public and all that. And I've worked on major investigative report, you know, reporting stories back home, and also at an international level where I've worked on several le I mean, leaks. Uh, I'm not, uh, I guess you are too young to maybe to remember the offshore leaks, uh, the 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 Mauritius leaks. I'm sure you are too young for that. The Panama Papers. Uh, the Pandora Papers, the Paradise Papers. So those are like major international collaboration, uh, coll coll collaborative, uh, you know, exercises that I did with the journalists around the world. And yeah, and, and also one thing that I did uh, was to really, you know, I also enjoy writing people's story. I enjoy meeting people and writing their stories. And I've done, you know, social investigative stories where I go to a refugee camp, spend some time there. Uh, you know, and, and try to understand these people because there are people. You know, they are not just statistics. There are people with, with you know, with parents, with, uh, with kids, and with lives, and with dreams, and with uh, aspirations, and all that. So, those are the stories that I sort of also enjoy doing. Yeah. Great. Um, can you share maybe um, maybe a most memorable story that you've maybe reported on, or even like an interesting story? that uh, you have experience reporting on and sharing? Who wants to go first? <laughs> go ahead. Tell us more about the Panama paper. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I've had a, a lot. But I think one thing that I sort of enjoyed doing the most, and uh, most people will say maybe it's the Panama Papers because it was big. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I enjoyed doing was um, uh, I was Back home in Botswana, that was 2017-18, and then there was this influx of refugees who were coming from uh, the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, and also from Somalia, from other places you know, around the, the world. And well, I, you know, together with my team, we just sort of wanted to sort of, you know, go there and get the story and talk to them and understand why they are coming into this country uh, in, in large numbers, because they were like in large numbers. So basically what we did, because mostly as journalists, and this is what happens around the world, journalists in most cases, they want to just go to, the, you know, to a, a place, get the story, and then run. So what we did with my team was to spend like two weeks in that refugee camp, spend, you know, eating what they were, they were eating, laughing at their jokes, trying to understand them, and, and really with that, I, I, it was so fulfilling that they opened up. They talked about their stories. They were like, you know what? This is what I went through. This is, you know, this is the, 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 the you know, the amount of kilometers I walked on foot to to reach this place and all that. And that was quite emotional and and also uh, sad to you know to to you know to hear the stories and all that. Uh, I interviewed uh, you know kids, uh, of course, with the uh, pay, pay permission from their parents. I interviewed elderly people uh, and spending time there and sleeping there. And that's what I think for me, I call that very authentic. That's, that's the journalism that we all want. Yeah. But of course, I have done other stories, but I, uh, yeah, I've just, yeah. Thank yeah, you. that is a really tough question, right? Because things are <laughs> memorable for different reasons. Yeah. Um, one that I like talking about because it's relatively recent was when I went up north. Um, so I went to Resolute Bay in Greece Fjord. Greece Fjord is the northernmost inhabited community in Canada. The military base, which is closer to the North Pole, is 
uh, another community, but it doesn't count because it's military. Um, and Greece and Ella, well, Greece and Resolute Bay were both um, inhabited inhabited by Inuit who were resettled up north from northern Quebec. Uh, so I went up there because up at the top of Canada is where we actually see most clearly how climate change is affecting people. Um, you, it, you don't have to go quite that far north. In, in Yellowknife and Iqaluit, you also see permafrost melting, shore, coastal erosion, that kind of thing. Um, but because I was with APTN, we wanted to see you know, what the Inuit experience was. And it's, it's a very different way of, uh, of life, but it's on a very, they've kept their culture because they are in such remote places. But they also have different perspectives on you know, what it means for changing climate. And some things have been positive and some things are negative and a few things are looming like in the future we don't know exactly what this will mean so it was really fascinating to go up there I had talked to a few people on Facebook but I didn't know anybody uh, so just going into town town is like almost a collection of like adco trailers mobiles um, that are that are in this small community and then tundra all the way around and um, just walking around the streets it was a, there's 126 people not counting people who are in like an adco camp there so incredibly small um, and incredibly magical. Like Alvin talked about, like we, I had a chance to actually spend 11 days between the two communities where you get to meet people. There wasn't one specific story that I was tracking. It was more just what, what concerns you here in the North. Of course, food prices, we hear about that a lot more now, but also hunting, also the changing way of life. Um, we now have, they now all have um, Elon Musk's internet, so they've got Starlink. Uh, and you can actually have Starlink on your remote cabin in the middle of nowhere, which was a drastic change in a place where they didn't have even um, like internet that you could rely on until relatively recent. And the way that that's changed their culture, the way that that's created uh, more isolation, the children aren't necessarily going outside and spending time with each other. And that's um, really drastic. It happened really quick compared to here in the South. They call us the South. Um, they think it's funny that we think we're northern, and yeah. it was um, yeah, it was just a really magical time. It's good. It's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. And uh, so, Danny, you've mentioned like local and national, and Alvin, you've mentioned international. Um, let's maybe talk about the the differences in when in journalism when you are looking at levels of local versus how you're going to. Um, share information on a national scale versus an international scale. Mm. Who wants to take this one? I think she, she can go first. <laughs> okay, Danny. <laughs> I'll, I'll start. Um, we did get a lot of local news experience today because that's what exists in Edmonton. You, to go for national, uh, APTN being the exception because the national desk is in Winnipeg, most of the national media would be in Toronto or <coughs> in Ottawa, um, where the federal government is. And so a lot of the stories or a lot of the questions that I think we think about um, when we think about news tend to happen at that national level. And then some of it, it's kind of difficult to apply that to a local level. You know, we hear a lot about bias, let's say, um, and there can be bias within a reporter, within um, the way that we tell the stories or the people that we pick to tell the stories. But then there's also a certain, you know, if you're trying to talk about like walleye on the river, like Liam was, or you have stories about, you know, feuding people into Williger. There is probably some kind of like uh, racial element being that like indigenous people make up a large portion of the homeless population in Edmonton. Um, like Alvin, I, we, I didn't go to refugee camps, but I did spend time in encampments in the summer to speak to people locally about what their life is like. And I think that the local news, it's often something that we we, it doesn't tend to win a lot of awards. It's like a very like, you know, is the snow plow out today? What do I, do I need to move my car? Um, you know, what festivals are going on? It's not something that's gonna like win an award, but it's very valuable and we tend to pick it up and it informs what we know about the city without really having to put in a ton of effort. Like it's just kind of in us. Like you hear it on the radio, you hear it from your parents, you hear just local events and that's through news. National news you deal with broader topics. Um, you know, if I'm writing a story, say, on opioids, um, of course, I would look at the issues here on the ground and speak to people. But when I nationalize it, I would take that and explore how that's happening in other provinces in Canada, how that works. 
Um, you know, you can also take that internationally. You need a different budget, but you can start to look at like how the global drug network filters all the way down to individual. And that's where you get like gang and crime and all kinds of complex stories. So you can tell one story, like the opioids, you know, opioid, uh, the overdoses in the community, that's local. Uh, how it's happening across the country, that's national. What the crime networks look like globally, that's international. And I just think that's a, it's an important thing to know those different distinctions of, of news and where you get into the different nuances when we start to talk about bias or we start to talk about uh, even censorship. Um, I think people think more on the, the national level because you're probably not necessarily experiencing significant censorship topics when you're like interviewing the mayor about potholes, right? That's not something like, now the exception would be New Brunswick, which is a very small community paper run by a local family where they actually do have quite tight control on the media, but that's hopefully uh, irregular in the country. Yeah. Okay, so uh, basically for, because I've not worked in Canada as a, as a news reporter, but mostly in Africa, in, in my home country, Botswana and also South Africa. But I've also like worked at, with international you know, news organizations and international reporters. In most cases, uh, because I'm still a member of international uh, consort, consor consortium of I investigative reporters, in most cases as if we have a story, we, we share. If there is a league, a big league somewhere in Germany, uh, the, the issue is to say, you know, we are going to spread you know, the, the league and share the league amongst you know, all the reporters within the network. So when we worked on the Panama Papers, there were about close to 400 reporters. We worked on that for like, how many, how many, uh, I think one year, but nothing leaked. Like 400 of us in different places around the world, uh, I, I was in Botswana in South Africa. Uh, the other guys were in, in, in say, in, 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 in Europe. There were other guys here in Canada working for CBC, Toronto Star, uh, and also in the U.S. and all that. But we worked together as on, on an international story that was, you know, ultimately the biggest story that we have ever done that time. So, uh, and, and in most cases, what it needs when you are working as a team is, is it needs uh, trust. I think trust in journalism is a big thing if you're going to work as a team because we had uh, sort of asked ourselves to say, you know what, we have told ourselves to say, you know what, we have this leak and we met somewhere, uh, you know, in secret to say we have this leak and nothing should, uh, you know, uh, come out for one year. And yeah, so. We wrote the story, the Panama, the Panama Papers. We wrote, uh, I think, more than, more than close to 1,000 stories by different, uh, you know, re re reporters. And the impact itself was at an international level. The impact was at an international level. Uh, you know, if you still remember, I don't know if you will remember, but some people resigned. I think the Prime Minister of uh, is it Finland resigned. But also there were also pushbacks. Uh, you know, one gen journalist from Malta was killed in a car bomb. And also, there was also pushback even for some of us in other smaller countries. There was pushback. You know, politicians were not happy with what we have done because basically what we did, we just exposed the rich and the powerful to say this is where they're hiding their money. They're hiding their money in offshore. They don't want to pay tax. And, uh, and as a result, you know, this really impacts on, on, on the, the livelihoods of, of all, all the people. Yeah. Mm, I don't know if I've yeah. answered your question. Perfect. So maybe I'll ask another question. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, mobile journalism? What that's about and um, what makes it something that has become so common these days? Well, I think uh, because of, you know, the, you know, the internet and later on because of the, you know, the mobile phones and, you know, the fact that now you can live stream. I think it's now imperative for journalists to sort of now understand how to use their mobile devices uh, to tell stories. Basically, uh, a few years ago, I was on a, that, that was 2018, I was on a fellowship at the University of Oxford. What we did then, and that was quite new, what we did then, we started a course where we were teaching journalists how to use mobile devices. Mobile devices here could be a cell phone, it could be an iPad, it could be anything really to tell a story because uh, you know some of us are like our, our, cell, our cell phones like you know your iPhones are very powerful they can, and they can really capture uh, you know um, you know you know video like quality video and all that so 
Uh, mobile journalism, uh, well, I have taught some courses where, you know, st to students, always, you know, we, we, we ask students to go out and, and tell stories and talk to people using their mobile devices. And I think it's very, very important. And with, with time, cameras like this one are still going to be very important, but m our mobile devices are, are going to be very much important. Yeah, um, we can take your question. If yeah, not to absolutely. Yeah. Um, I was just going to ask if you think that the journal journalism has become less effective being on a mobile device or being more digitized. Well, well I, I, I think uh, it's it's well, well, well look. <laughs> So I think journalism itself will, will not change. Journalism itself, whether it's on a, a mobile device, whether it's on, on paper, whether, whether it's on the internet, it should remain the same. The principles should remain the same and should not change. And, and, and for me, I, I don't think anything should change. It should remain the same. As long as you, you understand the, the, you know, the basic principles, you understand the way you're telling, you know, you know, the ways to tell the story, it should remain the same. Nothing should change, and I don't think it has changed much. Of course, there are, you know, we are now talking about other other issues that are coming, you know, misinformation and all that. But I don't think journalism itself, the real journalism, I'm not talking about Fox, I'm not talking about uh, MSNBC, I'm talking about real stuff journalism. I don't think that much has changed. We still have good journalism coming from uh, CBC. We still have good journalism coming from uh, Toronto Star, Globe and Mail, Washington Post, New York Times. Uh, and I don't think it has changed that much, but there are challenges. Yeah. yeah I Did think I answer you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the same. Um, I think where we're seeing, I mean, we're seeing an issue, of course, with the reduction in reporters. Like, I've never worked in a time of prosperity in reporting either, but um, those newsrooms used to be completely full. Now, it was summer, there were people on vacation, but like CBC, used to have more people, you heard global, there's now three people doing the job that six people done have are doing. There's um, remote work as well. Um, I remember I was doing a panel one day, there were cameras, the next week it was all radio controlled in Calgary, so the, the tech crew was not even here. So those are all changes, but also what, like we, we don't necessarily have a high media literacy in Canada, I'll speak to Canada, that's what I'm most familiar with for the news market, America, we can't help but see that too. They obviously have some struggles. The people that, there's, but there are people who present themselves in a way that looks like journalism but might not be journalism. Or it might be focused on analysis, opinion, mm -hmm. to the exclusion of that, like the first draft and, and the history and getting the facts down. Like there are people, and, and I think that there's a place for analysis. There's a place that we actually, we do need people to help us to understand what the event means rather than just what the event is. But you'll see now it's very common for misinformation to happen during disasters. You know, video used to be reliable. Now it may not be. Pictures might not be reliable. So um, I think that's where we're seeing mm -hmm. the, like, where we're seeing digital possibly create an erosion. It's not necessarily within journalism, but it's that uh, consumers don't necessarily know the difference. Yeah. Like, you know, my, my aunt is, like, constantly sharing, like, Freedom Eagle News or whatever yeah. on Facebook, something that's not a real site, I don't think, but something that like aligns with what her belief about its subject is, which is more important than whether or not it's true, right? And that's kind of a unfortunate human instinct that's always been with us. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there's a little bit of contamination when it comes to, 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 to news because we are struggling uh, now with saying, who is a journalist? Can anyone become a journalist? You know, uh, wake up and say, you know what? I'm a journalist. I can now re report. I can do that. So I always tell my students to say, you know what? I think we, for us, those who have gone through journalism school and all that, we should treat journalism itself as a science. You know, because there are methods, there are methodologies that are followed to get to the story. But now these days, we find that there are so many people on YouTube who are now presenting themselves as, as journalists who are, are sometimes even peddling mis misinformation and all that. And I think we should be careful. Uh, about that, and that's why you should come to 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 you know, know here to you know to study journalism because we'll teach you the science and the methods of really, of really you know you know pursuing stories and writing st stories and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we do here, yeah. right? Yeah. Teach you how to do it and teach you how to do it the right way. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes. Um, throughout your time working in investigative journalism, do you think 
your personal political opinion have changed? That's a good question. That's a very good question. You, the, the, the thing is, I, I, I think I still have my political and, 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 and you know, you know, opinions, but I don't share them, and I don't want them to sort of be on the way if I'm with you in a story. I try to be as fair as possible. I don't believe in the concept of objectivity, but I believe that I have to be as, pa as transparent as possible with my methodologies, with my, you know, my methods, uh, with, uh, you know, sort of to be transparent with my, you know, audience to, to let them know where I got this information and how I got the information and all that, my personal views and my opinions, I try by all means to, set, to make sure that they are uh, nowhere my, 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 near my stories. I don't want to sort of, you know, talk about what I believe in. I can do that with my family or with my wife, but my opinions should not really influence, um, you know, the way I see uh, or the way I perform my job. Mm -hmm. Did you find it difficult in the beginning to keep your political opinions separate, and did it eventually become second nature? Political opinion? Well, like I said, my, op my political opinions, I, I don't want my political opinions to be influencing the way I do my job. I just want to, well, if, if for example, there is a, a leak to say that a minister uh, went on a holiday with, uh, you know, with a, a, a girlfriend and all that, and they were using, uh, you know, an aircraft, using taxpayers money and all that, I'm going to approach that without even thinking about my own political, you know, uh, leanings and all that. Um, no, I don't think it's difficult. I, th I don't think it's difficult because we are, we are paid to do the job. We were paid to do, I was paid to do, to, to, to do the job. And I'm a professional, we are professionals. We, as journalists, we are, we are, we are professionals and we, we, we and, and also there are code of ethics that we should also uh, uh, follow. Uh, and, and each newsroom, uh, each news organization has its own clear code of ethics that they should follow. I, th I think that you do have to reflect on it though, like yourself, or at least speaking for myself, that's something that you have to think about. Working for the indigenous broadcaster was, was interesting because it's sort of, it, although there's politics, it's sort of outside of what the mainstream political sphere is. Um, like chiefs don't have political parties in communities, but they often will be aligned with a political party. Um, but they wouldn't exclusively align with that political party either because, you know, regardless of who's around in Alberta, um, the chiefs need a road built to their community that would be federal, but they'd also work with the province. So often it's, it's not within the same parameters. And then there's also not really a government that hasn't screwed over indigenous people in the country. So it's like, it's not quite as, um, it's just very different than when I've covered mainstream um, politics. So that makes it easier to step outside of it, I think. Um, however, the inherent tension in that is that we, we do cover indigenous stories. So there's stories that don't get covered because, not because our audience doesn't care, but because they get that, they can get those stories elsewhere. They can't necessarily get these stories and voices here, but that still creates, you know, things that get reported on and things that do not get reported on for the organization. Mm. Mm. Okay. Great. Good. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wow. How did it go? I think it was good. <laughs>